Hello everyone, good morning and thank you very much for being here. My name is Vanika Balasubramanian. I'm one of the co-founders and CEO at Repurpose Global, the world's leading plastic action platform, helping brands take responsibility for their plastic usage. I've been really looking forward to being here with you today um, at Unpacked. So much of what we do at Repurpose is living and breathing sustainable packaging. Um, so it's really lovely to see so many of you gathered here today with such genuine passion to do something um, about your environmental footprints. Uh, we're going to be talking about a lot of things today. I'm really excited. We're going to be talking about the, the plastic crisis, about plastic credits, uh, the plastic neutral certification for brands, um, and importantly, of the significance of the plastic crisis, not just on the, on the environmental side of things, on the planet, um, but also on, on the humanitarian side of things, and the millions and millions of people who suffer the consequences um, of our plastic crisis every single day. Uh, so yeah, let's jump right in. So when we think about the plastic crisis, I think there are always so many statistics that are thrown out there. Um, I was reading this really interesting paper the other day that was published last year by the Pew Trust and the Ellen MacArthur Foundation that talked about how the amount of plastic leaking into the environment is going to triple by 2040. In fact, um, every 20 minutes, over 20 million pounds of plastic waste is generated. So that's the time that I'm going to be speaking with you today. And from when I started to when I end, over 20 million pounds of plastic waste would have been created. And the sad reality is that the majority of that, over 90% of that, will find its way into nature. It's either going to be landfilled or dumped or, or leaked into our rivers and oceans. And as a consequence, over 1 million seabirds and 100,000 marine animals die each year from plastic pollution. Um, there was this, you know, a really horrifying fact about how 100% of baby sea turtles today have plastic in their stomachs. And we've been finding it everywhere. We've been finding it from the placenta of a newborn baby to the depths of the Pacific Ocean to kind of Mount Everest and in the peaks of the Alps and Antarctica. It's, it's really everywhere. And it's a devastating issue. But the one piece of hope that we have is that there is growing awareness on this topic. Plastic waste today is the number one environmental concern on CPG consumers' minds globally. We, we can feel plastic, we can touch it, um, and we feel bad about it when we use it and then throw it away. However, even with all of this growing awareness, despite um, this you know, sea of change uh, that, that we're seeing, the one thing that often doesn't get talked about is the the human cost of the plastic crisis. And we're going to focus a little bit on that today, um, just so we're not ignoring this enormous intersectional negative externality to our plastic consumption. So to give it a little context, when plastic waste is generated in countries like the US or the UK where I am today, oftentimes it actually does not get dealt with completely domestically. We recycle within our borders what is easy and what is profitable, but the hard to recycle materials, the, the difficult to manage waste, this is quite literally put on a ship and sent halfway across the world to places like Vietnam or Malaysia or India or Indonesia, or increasingly these days, especially after um, the, the China ban, you know, places like Somalia or Ethiopia and in Egypt. And, Illegal shipping actually accounts for 25% of all waste shipment globally. And that's a major roadblock to recycling because over 50 million tons of plastic waste is shipped out of the global north into the global south um, you know, over, over the last two decades. And we have no idea where it went. There is very little regulation because oftentimes these countries don't have the adequate infrastructure, the adequate policy frameworks in place, leading now to all sorts of environmental environmental um, and in humanitarian issues. And when we think about kind of like that, that real impact on the ground in these countries,
country's mismanaged waste kills over half a million people, anywhere between 500,000 to a million people every single year. And that's a terrifying number, really. And then, you know, horrifyingly large for something that is barely talked about. And sitting at the center of the social crisis is something called the informal waste management sector. So we'll dive into this a little bit. Formal waste management means often public entities like local municipalities, um, you know, or, or governments arrange for the door to door collection of waste or, or some sort of equivalent mechanism like curbside pickup. However, in the absence of this structure, an informal sector is created. In countries with poor infrastructure, all waste is most often directly sent into a landfill or dumped somewhere, even if it is recyclable. So there then exists, you know, it creates this new profession called waste picking or rag picking, where people go work in local landfills and dump sites to sort through all the waste and pick out the materials that have high recycling value and, and kind of pick it out in ways that can be then sold on to middlemen and other aggregators who often tend to be really exploitative. So that's why the presence of this informal sector is why in countries like India and in Indonesia and so on, you see materials materials that are high in value, like the, the harder types of plastic, like your PET, have almost a 70% recovery rate that exists, not because there is formal infrastructure, but because you have millions and millions of informal waste workers who are manually doing this job that we are ignoring um, in, in, in a formal capacity. Now, because this whole sector is so informal in nature, it also means that it is extremely unregulated. And then so you have about 15 to 20 million people globally working as waste pickers. And, and it's, a, it's a cycle that perpetuates uh, poverty over generations. 99% of waste pickers work more, report working more than 10 hours a day. And the majority, over 70%, can't actually read or write and oftentimes what you see is that if if you know you are in the profession of waste picking it is highly likely that your children go into that same profession and it becomes a cyclical poverty trap and of course, as with anything, you know, we're, we're big believers in looking at most issues in a very intersectional format. And even with this, you know, poverty trap that we're talking about, there are other systemic disparities that come into play as well. Let's say gender as an example. The lowest rungs of the informal waste sector, the people who do the hardest work but make the least amount of money, the ones who are actually out there in landfills doing the actual waste picking, tend to be women. And the aggregate you know, the, the ones that are purchasing informally from them tend to be men. So there is that, that you know, very obvious gender disparity that comes in a lot of times. Um, there are also other issues that complicate this, like the caste system. So in places like India, where you have a very pronounced caste system, certain, um, you know, just by virtue of the family that you're born into, or what your last name is, you're almost relegated um, to be a waste picker. And that's just kind of the profession that's given to you by society. And because the people are working day in and day out with garbage, then they're also kind of somehow deemed to be dirty um, and an untouchable, you know, the, the, the whole caste system with the untouchables come in and, and so on. So you have all of these complexities that, that get interwoven, but at the beginning of it, what, what really is happening is our lack of responsibility, our lack of accountability for the plastic waste that we are creating that then has this massive ripple effect um, in a very socioeconomic way around the world. And this is, you know, I think we can we can talk about all of these statistics, we can talk about um, all of these, uh, you know, numbers and whatnot. Um, but oftentimes, it's the day to day stories that really stay with you. So this became uh, an issue that was close to my heart. Um, when we first got started. So this was back a few years ago, back when I was in college, um, my co founders and I actually wrote our thesis on the informal waste sector. And we spent a long time on the ground going from landfill to landfills, dumping grounds to dumping grounds, um, really trying to understand what the context was like on the ground. And I still remember, you know, some of the stories that we would hear 
Um, for instance, there was this one young man that we met. He was in his uh, 20s and he had been a, a waste uh, picker in, in Devnar, which is in Mumbai, India, one of Asia's largest landfills, um, since he was four years old. And when you have landfills that are just dumping waste one on top of each other, you know, just compressing it, there's a lot of anaerobic decomposition of that waste that happens, which then generates toxic gases like methane um, that can, you know, create little fires. So you have a lot of these landfill fires and and so on but often you're not seeing it from the top it's kind of like a little pocket inside the landfill that's happening and and so this young man kind of went and accidentally dislodged a piece of waste and unearthed this this entire kind of like you know fire that came spewing out and then he lost his leg you know got burnt and then lost his leg in the process all before he he turned 20 years of age. And then so these sorts of stories um, are, are not isolated. It, it is not one single story. It's not unique. Over 90% of informal waste pickers, these, these millions of people that we're talking about, report having some work-related injury or illnesses. Oftentimes, these informal settlements have a life expectancy of just about 40 years because of so many other concerns like you know lung cancer and an inhalation of toxic fumes, um, the physical dangers of being in a landfill environment, all of these things um, come together. And so there's so much more that we can, you know, kind of uh, dig into over here, but I am kind of, you know, mindful of, of uh, the time that we have. So let's, let's move on, right? Let's think about how do you turn the tide on the plastic crisis? There is this massive environmental problem. There is this massive socioeconomic problem. What can we do to, to change things? Um, in, in quite, I would say, maybe perhaps millennial fashion, um, our first answer at Repurpose, actually, um, in all honesty, we said, well, why don't we build a technology platform? Um, is there some kind of app that we can build? Maybe some sort of like Uber for trash that, that allows people to find waste before it gets into landfills and formalizes, you know, brings the gig economy to, to this informal waste sector, formalizes the whole process. We tried a lot of different things. Um, and then the, the short answer is that none of it worked and and the reason it didn't work was because we then found out that there was already so much efficiency um, that was in the informal sector. There was so much energy and expertise and experience that had gone into optimizing for every link, oftentimes optimizing for different uh, different pieces. Um, I remember there was this uh, one gentleman um, who could sort waste into 40 different subcategories blindfolded um, just by touching it, just by feeling the, the waste in his hands. And that's the kind of experience that we realized we shouldn't be trying to you know, sidestep and then remove from the equation, but rather learn from the kind of experience that we can build on. So there's already this efficiency can we kind of formalize it? Can we bring better environmental and social additionality over here? It was that thinking that, that we went into um, the, the whole end of our width and, and built the world's first plastic credit platform. Um, so here we looked to the carbon market and said carbon credits in their own right have been quite revolutionary in being able to unlock private sector funding for solutions that could combat the uh, climate crisis. So could we apply those same principles? Could we do the same thing, but for plastic? And in doing so, really kind of open up this space and bring financing, bring crucially, urgently needed financing to help build up the right sort of policies, the right sort of infrastructure um, on the ground, both environmentally and, and socially speaking. So today, one plastic credit is the equivalent of one additional kilogram of plastic waste that is removed from nature. And what it really does is gives you a unifying currency, a common language to compare across talk about and importantly invest in many different sorts of plastic um, activities and so right now uh, the, the repurposed plastic credit platform operates in five different countries and in several um, towns and villages and cities within each of these countries doing everything from you know quite literally removing plastic out of the ocean um, off the coast of Indonesia to building entirely new supply chains for waste management um, where none existed before for on the southern Indian coastline. And all of these different activities are, are being funded by a group of incredible dynamic
dynamic brands that have come in and said, we want to use this financing instrument and leverage it to account for our plastic footprints. So we now work with almost 250 uh, brands across 16 different countries um, doing very, very many different things um, to remove plastic from the environment. Um, and then the one crucial piece over here um, is the plastic neutral certification. So it's again important to think about um, actioning on plastic waste as a brand, not really, you know, just as a charitable thing that, that we do from the good of our heart, but rather something that we are responsible for, that the brand feels accountable for. And the plastic neutral certification allows you to do that because essentially what you're doing is measuring your own plastic footprint, looking at how much plastic you are putting out there into the environment, and then financing the removal of an equivalent amount from from nature. So let me give you a quick example. Um, let's say as a brand, you come in, the first activity we do is help you measure your plastic footprint. And we have a, a kind of, you know, a strict methodology that works on that. Let's say, you know, you're using about 100,000 kilograms of plastic every single year. Then we can work together to figure out how you can reduce that, how you can redesign, perhaps use some alternative materials to really close that tap a little bit. And then, you know, the, the, the remaining amount that is still going out there um, for that 100,000 kilograms, you know, about um, 55 cents a kilogram, you would contribute $50,000 to the platform. And we would use that funding to remove one. 100,000 additional kilograms of plastic waste from nature um, that otherwise would have stayed there, that otherwise would have sat in that landfill, sat in that river for decades to come, had it not been for your express funding. And that's what we call um, the additionality guarantee, which is, you know, basically saying that we're not just going to account for something that would have already happened. How do we maximize the return on impact um, for the investment that, that you're making um, and then apply kind of a strict rigor to that? So I'll kind of wrap over here um, with one one example of how all of this fits together and then you know the pieces that we talked about with the environmental and the socioeconomic the plastic neutral how it all comes together so some of you might be familiar um, with Grove Collaborative. They're one of our favorite, uh, they're a retailer, but also their own brand. Um, one of our favorite, um, you know, brands to work with. And then they went plastic neutral a couple of years ago. And as a rather large brand, they're able to do multiple different sorts of plastic waste innovations and finance them across the world. But the one that you see on the screen here um, is a really interesting one where we came in and we took this group of uh, five villages in southern India. Um, for those of you who've been to India, this sits on the coast of uh, uh, Kerala. And, and these villages had absolutely no municipal waste collection whatsoever. And so all of the waste that was being created was either slipping out into the oceans or, or being openly burnt, um, incinerated, or being dumped somewhere. And then what we realized was what was missing over here, crucially, um, was a lack of collection on that first mile level. And then so we were able to use the plastic credit financing to establish door-to-door -door collection, door-to-door -door kind of collection and then segregation across 40,000 different households, bring all of this waste, you know, to centrally manage material collection facilities, and then on word to a material recovery facility and then ensuring that every single piece of plastic that could be recycled did get recycled and none of the plastic ever ended up in the ocean in the Indian Ocean um, and none of the plastic ever got landfilled or dumped or incinerated but rather found its way to a reliable ethical environmental and destination and in setting up this supply chain we're now able to keep away almost one million pounds of plastic um, away from the Indian Ocean every single year. And that's the environmental um, additionality over there. But then there's also the crucially needed socioeconomic piece, where in setting up the supply chain, it also created almost 194 new jobs. And so these were 84 women and 10 men 
who were previously in the informal sector that were now brought into the fold and, and with that given all of the benefits of a formal working environment. So that means social security, that means health insurance. Um, a lot of times, you know, their kids are going to school for the very first time. Um, the very first sanitation facilities were built for them. And, and so all of these benefits that come um, together on a social level to break that poverty trap that we see in the informal waste management sector. Um, so that I, I hope, uh, you know, that there was a lot of information there, um, but I hope it gave you a little bit more, you know, understanding and color and nuance on the different complexities and intersectionalities um, of the global waste trade, of the, the global waste management ecosystem. Um, we'd love for all of you to join us. Um, there's going to be a panel right after this. Um, so please stay tuned where you can hear from some of the brands that we work with um, on why they went plastic neutral and on why they are investing. Um, in plastic waste solutions um, across the world. Um, you can also reach out to us uh, at uh, letstalk at repurpose.global. Thank you so much.